have I got some apocalyptic news for you. Sorry, but after finishing a number of videos on Revelation, I just couldn't help myself. I was thinking about what to dive into next this week. And as I was planning on doing a video, did Jesus have a weight problem? Because every time you turn around, this guy is eating with someone in the gospel accounts. So why did Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular spend so much time telling us about his eating habits? Because it was important. We really don't understand that today. And I was hoping on exploring why this was so significant in their day. But, but, but then I read this article today and it was all about the apocalyptic, I know, there I go again, the apocalyptic end of Sodom and Gomorrah. If this is your first time here, my name is David Paris, and this is the Caffeinated Bible. I've been teaching at seminaries and around the world for the past 20 plus years, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in those institutions and bring it to you on YouTube. So if you find these videos informative and helpful and encouraging, please do me a favor. Subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, and smash that share button underneath this video. Let someone you know, know about these videos. Thanks. Okay, where was I? Oh yes, Sodom and Gomorrah. Our next door neighbor's dog keeps barking in the background. There's not much I can do about that. I'm hoping it doesn't come out in the video. I don't think it will, but I hope not. And I sure hope it stops before God rains fire and brimstone down upon it. A team of 21 scientists from 18 different institutions, the United States, Canada, and the Czech Republic, just published a very interesting article in the September issue of Nature Scientific Review. Now this team includes, let me see if I can get this right, archeologists, geologists, geochemists, geomorphologists, mineralogists, paleobotanists, sedimentologists, astronomers, and medical researchers. And I'll include a link to their article underneath this video where you can read it for free on your own. But be warned though, it's 150 pages long. Now, luckily for me, they published their results with a Creative Commons license, which means I can talk about it here and share their research with you as long as I give credit to them. And that's in the show more section underneath here. In this article, they summarize their result of doing research in the Jordan River Valley on the east side, about 20 miles away from Jericho, that's on the West Bank. For the past 15 years, archeologists have been excavating the ruins at Tal El Hammam, and they were puzzled by their findings. Tal El Hammam was a large, fortified urban center and perhaps one of the largest cities in the ancient Near East during its day. Shortly before its demise, Tal El Hammam was estimated to have a population of around 50,000 people, about eight to 10,000 in that city alone, but then there were a number of small cities around it. This city prospered from 4,700 BC to around 1650 BC, when all of a sudden it came to a cataclysmic end. What could have caused its sudden downfall and the fact that another city wasn't built on that site for three to 600 years? Well, there's some interesting clues in the ruins. First off, it had a four to five foot thick layer of destruction covering the archeological site. But this layer of destruction is not the typical type of layer that you would have if the city was conquered during a war and then burned or if an earthquake hit it. Rather, the remains of pottery on the site were melted into glass. Some showing signs that it boiled away when this happened. Roofing tiles melted, as well as the plaster on the buildings. Wood was carbonized. Bones and cobblestones were turned into a chalk-like substance. Whatever happened to Tel al-Hammam would have required extremely high temperatures. So what could have done this? I think that's definitely gonna get on the video. This layer of debris or destruction was the first clue that the team worked off of. There are no volcanoes in the area, so that's out of the question. And the sacking and burning of the city during a war would not have produced the extreme heat needed to create this degree of destruction. 
Starting with this layer of debris and destruction, they reverse engineered a solution. One of the team members speculated that maybe an asteroid could have caused this level of destruction. Using an impact calculator, and yes, there are certain things and they're based upon what we know from similar asteroid impacts in the past, they can actually see if an asteroid could have caused this level and degree of destruction. Perhaps one of the best known asteroid impacts occurred in 1908 in Tunguska, Russia. The asteroid that struck the area was probably about 160 feet in diameter and was traveling around 60,000 miles an hour when it hit the atmosphere. Luckily, this asteroid struck over a sparsely populated region of Siberia, and they estimate that when this asteroid exploded about four to six miles above the ground, it leveled 80 million trees in an 830 square mile area. If this hit a major city today, it would totally decimate it. This is the largest asteroid impact or explosion in modern history, but the Earth has been hit thousands of times over its long history. Around 10,000 BC in the area of Abu Hurairah in what is now modern day Syria, that city was destroyed by an asteroid explosion as well. And it is now thought that the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs was from an asteroid almost six miles across that struck somewhere near the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Working off the data from these impact calculators, they came to a remarkable conclusion that Tal El Hammam experienced an asteroid explosion above the city. They were able to collect about 18 different types of sources of evidence that supported this hypothesis. Perhaps some of the biggest ones is first off, there's no impact crater in this area. So the asteroid did not strike the ground, but exploded as it heated entering the Earth's atmosphere. The second thing is, is that this area is covered with what is called shock quartz. These are very, very tiny, small sand particles. And to fracture them this way requires an immense amount of pressure. The destruction layer is also powdered with very, very small diamonds smaller than a flu virus, but similar to zirconium, you know, sort of these fake diamonds that we can create these days. These are the remains of wood fibers that were seared under incredibly high temperatures and pressures. To melt the pottery and brick into sort of like a glass compound would have required a temperature of almost 3000 degrees or higher. So what happened to this city? Around 1650 BC, some of the inhabitants of the city may have taken one last look up at the sky for a brief second. If they did, they would have seen an asteroid streaking across the sky at 38,000 miles per hour. When it was about two and a half miles above them, it exploded. This explosion would have been a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima. The first thing that would have happened is that burst of light would have blinded everyone within the region in that city instantly. Less than a split second later, the temperature shock wave would have hit over 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to melt a car in seconds. The entire city would have been incinerated in a split second. The people in that city would have literally exploded as the water and the fluids in their body immediately turned from liquid to steam. Metal and even bricks and pottery were melted instantaneously. About two seconds later, the second blow hit. A massive shock wave that would have leveled anything left standing. Traveling at almost 750 miles per hour, anything still standing was leveled to the ground. Bodies and bones blasted into tiny fragments. This shock wave sheared off the top 40 feet of the temple palace structure Debris blown out from this destructive shock wave was blown over the tops of the nearby mountain ridges and into the adjacent valleys. It even leveled ancient Jericho that was about 20 miles away on the western side of the Jordan River Valley. This raises the question, what does all this have to do with the book of Revelation? Absolutely nothing. But it does raise questions about Genesis 19 and the story of Sodom. In Genesis chapter 19, God sent two angels to rescue Abraham's nephew Lot from Sodom. In Genesis 19, God sent two angels to rescue Abraham's nephew Lot from Sodom. 
Genesis 19, verses 12 through 13 reads, Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Son-in-laws, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against this people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The next day, Lot and his family fled the city. In verses 24 through 25, we are told that then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. In verse 28, we're told that Abraham, who is across the Jordan Valley on the top of the mountains over in Canaan, modern day Israel, Abraham could see the destruction. The smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Genesis nineteen twenty-eight. Now the archaeology in Tal al-Hamam does not validate the biblical account of Sodom. But these two accounts do coincide with each other in some very, very important ways. First, the dating of the story in Genesis 19 is very close to the dating of the destruction of Tal al-Hamam around 1650 BC. Second, the description of Sodom's destruction in Genesis is remarkably similar to an asteroid explosion. Third, this is the only city that we have evidence of that was destroyed by an asteroid explosion in that area during the time, and Genesis does not record anything else similar to this during that period also. Is Tal al-Hamam the biblical Sodom? If Genesis does recount the destruction of Tal al-Hamam, then this is the earliest account of an asteroid explosion of this scale. The naming discrepancy is not that big of an issue. The Hebrew Bible refers to it as Sodom, Modern Arabic refers to it as Tal al-Hamam. If the Genesis account does recount the destruction of Tal al-Hamam as Sodom, then it is the earliest written account of an asteroid explosion of this scale. I'm sure that their findings in this article are going to create some very interesting debate and research among Old Testament scholars and archaeologists. And it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out in the coming years because their findings were just published a month ago in September 2021. An interesting side note to all this is oftentimes my students will ask me, look, the Bible has been studied for over 2,000 years. Is there anything new that we can learn? Well, this is a great example of new evidence that's come to light that might shed light on ancient texts. So the work of archaeologists and historians and biblical scholars is not done yet. There's a lot of interesting discoveries yet to be made. Now, just to leave you on a cheery note, astronomers estimate that there are over 25,000 asteroids that are in close proximity to Earth or in a similar orbit pattern. All you have to do is go outside during one of the meteor showers, perhaps the Perseid meteor shower, and to see the smaller ones burn up as they streak across the sky. It's really spectacular and you should do it sometime. And odds are that a larger one, like the one that wiped out Tel Al Hamam, will hit us again. With that encouraging note, I will leave you till next week.